Holy wow. We didn't expect this many people. Welcome. Better be good. All right. <laughs> so welcome to another edition of our free lecture series we're putting on here at the Rocky Mountain School of Photography. Tonight, we got the pleasure of our co-director of the school, Forrest Chaffet, talking about astrophotography. And one thing to mention, for those of you tuning in on YouTube, any questions you have, put them down in the comments section and I will answer them to the best of my ability. If I can't, I'll give you everyone his email to <laughs> know him later on. So everybody enjoy and have a good time. And if you guys have questions, you just raise your hands. Um, a lot of you will learn from me before you know the drill. Uh, I like interruptions because I think it clarifies things for everyone. So don't feel like shy, like you have to withhold your questions till the end. So feel free to ask away. Um, I do want to say one thing. Uh, I'm kind of not required, but I'm going to do this. Um, B&H, for years, we've had a relationship with them. Um, they're a great camera store, for those of you guys who don't know. And for years, we've also had people requesting to live stream these lectures. We've never had the equipment we needed to do it. Um, this year, I reached out to B&H to ask if they wanted to sponsor these lectures, and they said yes. So this is, uh, those of you watching live, that's because of a B&H partnership. They made that happen. So thank you to B&H. You guys want to buy camera gear, buy it from B&H, because they're great. <laughs> Um, and the cool thing is for those of you guys watching here in the room, um, if you guys want a review on what I cover, it's recorded live on our YouTube channel. So it'll be there forever. So um, that's kind of nice. Cool deal. All right. So without, without delaying any more, I want to start talking about astrophotography. Now, I love astrophotography. It's one of my favorite things. And I think the reason I like it so much is it's one of those types of photography that you can go as in-depth as you can possibly imagine into it. I've probably spent legitimately a thousand hours researching and doing astrophotography, and I still feel like I've probably know and done about 10% of what there is to do. It's a crazy big, giant aspect of photography that I, if you guys know my dad, I like gear just like he does. It's also very gear centric. Um, but the cool thing is, and the thing that I want to focus on tonight, is how to do astrophotography without buying additional stuff. Uh, we will talk a little bit at the end, if, if you want to go further with it, what to purchase. But a lot of people don't realize that with the gear that you have, you can do really cool astrophotography, which is awesome. Um, now, the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about what I see astrophotography as being. What is astrophotography? Because I think a lot of people use different definitions of it. To me, and there's going to be arguments here that need to be had, and that's okay. To me, astrophotography is not star trails and wide shots of the Milky Way. That, to me, is night photography. For me, astrophotography is when you're coming up close in on galaxies, nebulas, star constellations. You're really only shooting celestial objects. That's, to me, what astrophotography is. Now, there are there arguments there for sure? Would people think that Milky Way and star trails are astrophotography? Yes, and that's totally fine. But to me, that's what I want the focus of this to be on, is coming in closer, kind of the more advanced level of night photography compared to what most people do. So that's what we're going to talk about. But in order to do that, we need to talk a little bit about basic star trails and Milky Way photography. So we'll start with that, then we'll transition into more complex stuff and we'll go as deep down into that as we get. So it should be pretty fun. First thing I want to do, though, is look at some examples of astrophotography, all right, and, and the different types there are. Now, I want to say one thing. If you see an image on the screen and it does not have a copyright symbol in the lower right-hand corner, I took it. If it does have a copyright symbol, I'm attributing to who took it. I did not shoot all of the images in this presentation because, like I said, I have that thousand hours of experience. There are people way better than me who've taken a lot longer to do this. So I want to show off their work as well. So lunar photography for sure is astrophotography. Who's taking a picture of the moon? All right, did it work? Yeah. Kind of. What did you notice about the moon compared to what you thought might happen? It moves. It moves for sure. That's important. What else? Contrast. Contrast. It's really bright. You guys, what's lighting up the moon? The sun. The sun. What's lighting up the earth on a bright sunny day? The sun. So the moon is as bright as the earth is on a bright sunny day. Well, when do you normally shoot the moon? At nighttime. So you see that contrast, right? That you're shooting the moon with a dark sky around it, and the moon is being illuminated by the sun. So there's a lot of contrast there. That's why you always see the moon against a totally black sky, because there's so much contrast there to get them both together. A lot of people don't realize that. Solar photography, all right? That's a really awesome shot of the sun. <laughs> And you guys can see sunspots and solar flares and things like that. You need very special filtration to do this. Don't do this without special filtration. Who shot the eclipse? Was it fun? 
Did anyone, who went to like totality, like actually went to the path of totality? Awesome, like so amazing. It gets cold, like oh my gosh. It was once in a lifetime experience, very cool. So solar photography, definitely legitimate type of astrophotography. A wide field Milky Way shot. So you guys can see a lot of astrophotographers will come in and grab just one chunk of that, right? Just grab a nebula or just grab a galaxy. But a lot of photographers, this was probably shot with maybe a 100 millimeter lens, pretty wide lens comparatively. Obviously, they're not using like a 2,000 millimeter telescope or something like that. But with a pretty normal lens that most people own, with enough pictures and enough data, which we'll talk about, you can get really cool stuff like that. Coming up really close. So this is very, very close in. This is a lot of time on the sky. Um, a lot of integration time, as we'll talk about. And that's a, that's a nebula or a star-forming region, so pretty darn cool. Galaxies. This is the, uh, I believe it's the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is a hard thing to shoot. I spent uh, six hours of time shooting this galaxy. So my camera was shooting six hours worth of exposure time on that target. And I'll show you the photo that resulted from six hours in a little bit. I'll give you a hint. It doesn't look anything like this. Like, <laughs> this is probably like 100 hours or 200 hours of exposure time, or night after night after night after night, all right? There's the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, our nearest galactic neighbor. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who want to get started in astrophotography and don't necessarily want to buy some gear, this is what... I would start with. This is one of those easier targets that you can actually see it with the naked eye. Who's looked up and seen it? You guys, anyone seen it? It just looks like a little fuzzy blob. You can see it. Um, it's pretty cool. That's one of our nearest galaxies, or our nearest galaxy. What was it called? The Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy. Another nebula here. All right. Also, planetary photography is totally a thing. This was shot by an amateur astronomer. Um, it was on Celestron's website using one of their little cameras. What people do with, with planetary photography is they shoot shot after shot after shot, like thousands of images, very, very quick shutter speed, very, very fast. Like they actually shoot video of the planets. And what they do with that is they stack them all together. Because if you think about it, you guys, what are you battling when you shoot a planet? What are, what's going to make that image look blurry? Movement. Movement for sure. But if you have a tracking mount, that's going to track with it. What is it that's making it blurred? Atmosphere. atmosphere. The atmosphere itself. And so what you can do is you can shoot shot after shot after shot after shot that average out to being no blur from the atmosphere. So people shoot thousands, tens of thousands of images and stack them to get sharp things like that. All right. So those are some example images. We'll talk about how to get those right now. All right. First thing, let's talk a little bit about the motions of the sky because you need to know what's causing the, what, essentially what battle we have to fight as astrophotographers, what we're up against when we do this, all right? So the Earth rotates under the stars. Hopefully you didn't think that the stars rotate around the Earth and we're fixed in space. Uh, that was the thoughts of a few hundred years ago. Uh, we've moved past that. And all the stars appear to rotate around a fixed point. So in the Northern Hemisphere, what do we call that fixed point? The North Star, right? Or Polaris. Polaris is kind of its fancier name. In the Southern Hemisphere, they have the Southern Cross. Count yourself lucky, it's way easier to find the North Star than the Southern Cross. Like, it's, it's a much simpler task. And that's awesome. We call that point, that North Star, and the North Star is not quite right on it. It's really close. The North Celestial Pole. That's essentially, that's the point where all the stars rotate around, appear to rotate around from our position. We're really rotating under them. All right? And what this does, you guys, is this gives us star trails. Now, star trails are a beautiful thing in themselves, but like I said, tonight's goal is to fight that, is to battle the star trail behavior and give ourselves something to work with that doesn't have blurred stars. We want sharp, nice, pointy stars, all right? So here's the thing. If you want sharp point stars, and that's a, a term that I'm gonna use again and again tonight, we can do one of two things. We can use a short enough shutter speed, meaning that our shutter is not open long enough for the star to move in appreciable distance. We can do that. Or we can get a tracking mount, which are like what you see up here and up here, which is like a little motorized tracker that moves with the sky and keeps things centered for you, keeps the stars in the frame. And these can run anywhere from like $300 on that end to like, that's more like $700 to like hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to go to like the ultra, ultra high end. But that lets you use super long shutter speeds and still get point stars. That's the goal here. All right. So here's a little diagram. We can see we have the South Celestial Pole, North Celestial Pole, and the, basically the way to think of where those are 
you just extend a straight line up from the North Pole of the Earth into the sky and from the South Pole. And then we have this thing called the celestial equator, which is if we extended a plane out in all directions through the Earth's equator. And those are terms we use and astronomers use quite a bit to talk about where things are on the sky. So that's kind of a useful terminology to get as you start doing more astrophotography. All right. So let's start by talking about basic night photography. All right. Let's just dump in and do a little bit of Star Trails Milky Way stuff because there's some topics there that you guys need to understand in order to fully get the astro stuff. Okay. So let's start with Star Trail images. I think they're awesome. They're pretty great, but they're not what we're here for primarily, but I do want to spend some time. So let's look at a few of those. So this is in Death Valley National Park, and you guys can see which direction am I facing, or is the North Pole in the frame? Let me ask an easier question. No, how do we know? Yeah, there's, two, there's no circle, right? The North Pole is where do you think from this image? It's at, this is in Death Valley National Park, so we're Northern Hemisphere, so it's gotta be up there, right? It's rotating around that side. That would be the Southern Pole down there below the equator if we were below the equator. All right, we can start to put things in the front. This is the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas in Arli. And you guys can see there's little breaks in my stars. That's because clouds were running in front of my star trail. So you can get cool effects like that sometimes. All right, another one. Now here again, North Star, upper right, right? You can pretty clearly see everything's rotating around that point. Also, you can see there's a little, either a shooting star or sometimes that's actually sunlight reflecting off of a solar panel on a satellite which is really cool. Like you get a satellite going by and the sunlight reflects perfectly and you get it in your shot. Like I kid you not, that's what you can get sometimes. It's very, very cool. All right, another one. Here we can see I'm actually on the equator or pretty close to the equator here. So everything's moving pretty straight. I'm aiming either east or west. So everything's straight lined. All right, another one. Another one. All right, so how do we shoot these? Well, there's two ways to shoot star trails. Who's done it before? Okay, how'd it go? Pretty good? Okay, cool. Um, the two ways to do it are a single exposure versus a multiple exposure. And they both have their pros and cons. There's, there's reasons to use one and there's reasons to use the other one. Let's talk first about single exposure star trails, why we might want to do a single exposure. All right? What we're going to do is we're going to basically, and you guys, it's a lot easier if you have like a cable release or a, um, you, if your camera happens to have the time mode where you push the button once to start the exposure and you push it again to stop the exposure. Most cameras don't have that though, so a cable release with a lock can help. You can put your camera on bulb, lock open the shutter for an extended period of time. All right, That's what you're going to do with a single exposure. Now, you want to leave your shutter open for an, a while. How, how long do you think? What do you guys think? How long should we leave our shutter open for? What does it depend on? Sunrise. Sunrise, for sure. Yeah, you don't want to go till the sun rises. But what else? What are you going to get the longer you leave your shutter open for? Longer trails, exactly. So I would say for me, I shoot for a minimum of about 20 minutes. Anything shorter than 20 minutes, it kind of looks like an accident, right? It looks like you just blurred your stars a little bit and you didn't mean to. When you get to 20 minutes and longer, you get really nice trails. Most of the ones I just showed you guys were about an hour, hour and a half. They were pretty long, good trails. Now, it very much depends which part of the sky you're pointing on. Because if you're pointing toward the North Pole, the North Celestial Pole, the stars are going to move less in the same amount of time because they don't have as far to travel. Remember, every star is going to do one full rotation in 24 hours. So if you go close to that circle, you're going to get much less movement in your hour than you will if you're like pointing toward the celestial equator. So depending where you're pointing, you can do different things. There are some cool apps out there that actually show you, depending where you're looking on the sky, how long of a trail you'll get per a given amount of time. It's kind of a cool way to do it. All right. Um, now, stars moving overhead is recorded on the sensor throughout that duration of the exposure. All right. And like I said, more time with the shutter open gives you longer trails. Pretty simple stuff. Now, big advantage here, you don't have any post-processing. When you're done and when you close that shutter, obviously you can brighten or darken and do things like that. But I mean, there's no required post-processing of you. Once the image is done, the star trail's built, and that's great. But there's a cost. What do you guys think, think the downside is? What's the disadvantage? Noise. Noise, right? Noise is that random variation, kind of looks like film grain from back in the day, right? Only it's ugly, not pretty like film grain used to be. Um, 
And it, it's, it's not a very pleasing look for the image. And what does noise, what causes noise, you all? Do you know? What causes it? It's heat. It's heat in your sensor. And heat in the sensor is generated one of two ways. Um, one way is duration of exposure. The longer the exposure you go, the more heat you're going to get. The other way is the ambient temperature. Obviously, if you have a higher ambient temperature, like you're outside in the middle of the summer and it's 85 degrees outside, you're going to get way more noise than if it's the middle of winter and it's negative 10. I love observing and doing astrophotography this time of year because it gets dark early and it's cold. And the sensor loves it when it's cold. You get way less noise, which is super awesome. All right, so you're fighting noise when you do this. So that's why multiple exposures are better for some people. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys. About five years ago, I told everyone to do the multiple exposure route because you got less noise doing it that way. These days, if you have a new fancy pants camera that's super awesome, a lot of them can do a single exposure and have still very little noise, a usable amount of noise. And then you cut out that whole post-processing element of the multiple exposure way. So I recommend you test it. You see what your camera is capable of, whether single exposure or multiple is better. All right. Now with multiple exposures, what you're going to do is you're going to shoot a lot of faster exposures and you're going to stack them in Photoshop. I actually have a video on our YouTube channel on how to do this, on how to do the stacking in Photoshop process. So check that out if you want to know how to do this process. Um, but what you want to do is you want to make sure the gap between your exposures is short. Why? Breaks in the trail. Yeah, breaks in the trail. And who's seen that? Anyone seen breaks in their trails? Okay. And it, it's ugly. It's like you get a little trail segment and then a little break and then a trail segment and then a break. And we'll look at that in a second. Okay, so you want to make sure that gap is short. You want to set your camera to continuous drive mode, right? That essentially means that as long as you're holding down the shutter, it will keep click, 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 click over and over and over and over again, okay? You really need an intervalometer or a cable release to do this. Like I said, you really want something that will continuously hold down that shutter button for you. Keep taking picture after picture after picture after picture, all right? And then you combine them in Photoshop, which honestly is like a 10 minute task. If you, don't, if you know nothing about Photoshop, and this is a, a true story for those of you who, I've heard some grumblings in the world about Adobe forcing everyone to switch to a subscription-based model. There's definitely some grumblings out there. The one good thing about that is that you get Photoshop included with your Lightroom fee, right? And having to pay monthly for Lightroom gives you Photoshop now. You can make star trails. Yes, right? <laughs> like if there's one thing you need Photoshop for, there it is right there. All right. I like this method. I know that with my camera specifically, the multiple exposure mode looks better than one solid shot. But again, that remains to be seen. There's a lot of really good low light performing cameras that do an excellent job. So yes. How, on average, how many exposures are you? So that depends. Um, I usually will do 30 second exposures is my go to duration because that's uh, if you guys look on your cameras, most cameras, that's as long as you can go, like as long as you can actually set on your cameras, 30 seconds. So I usually do 30 seconds, and duration completely depends on how much trail you want. So usually an hour, hour and a half of 30 second exposures, right? So if you're going to do an hour of 30 second exposures, that's you take 120 frames. You put them all together in Photoshop. Yep, yep, exactly. All right, now, this will give you gaps in your stars. And a lot of people think, yeah, right, Forrest. You have a one second gap between your 30 second exposures. There's no way you're going to see gaps in your stars. You're wrong. There is. <laughs> Let's look. So you guys see this image. It looks great, right? No gaps, everything's smooth. Let's zoom in. Ooh, right? Look at that. Gap, 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 all the way up. This was about a half a second gap between exposures. Half a second and the star moved enough that the camera registered it. So you really want to make sure it's going click, 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 like, well, not obviously that fast, 30 seconds between each one, but as soon as one 30 second chunk is over, you want the next one to start right away. All right, so you get gaps. Now, questions on star trails before we move on to points. Pretty simple, basically. You decide whether you want to do single exposure or multiple. If you want to do single, point your camera somewhere, lock it open, wait, if you're doing multiple, point the camera somewhere, put it on 30 seconds, and lock the shutter down, and it'll keep firing 30 seconds over and over and over again. Yes? So if you're using an intervalometer, mm -hmm. you recommend not putting any gap in there at all? Just 
Yes, that's a great question. So yeah, you guys, if you're going to do these using an intervalometer, if you're going to shoot your uh, the multiple exposure method using an intervalometer, set that gap to zero or to one, however little it will let you do. You really want it to just fire, 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 fire. Yep, over and over and over again. Great question. All right, star points. What this essentially is for the next little bit is going to be how we get sharp, nice, pointy, round stars. Now, the first bit of this is going to be specifically in re regards to the Milky Way, how we would shoot nice, wide shots of the Milky Way. Who's done this before? How did it go? Pretty cool, right? Kind of so-so. Might be me, your, uh, your eyes didn't see what your camera saw. Maybe your camera saw more than what your eyes saw. I know for me, when I'm shooting the Milky Way, it usually looks really good on the back of my camera. I'm like super jiving with what I see back there. And then I get home and I look on the computer and I'm like, oh, it's kind of blurry and things aren't great. Uh, there's definitely a little bit of a mismatch there. So we'll talk about that. All right. If you're going to shoot star points, the number one thing you need to learn is the 400 rule. Okay? The 400 rule. This is crucial. Now, you guys, let's think about this. With exposing, we have three major exposure considerations, right? We have our ISO, our aperture, and our shutter speed, all right? I want to make this super simple because it really is. Astrophotography exposure-wise is super simple, okay? What do you want your aperture or your f-stop to be for pretty much all astrophotography you're ever going to do? As wide open as you can get it, right? So if you have an f2.8 lens, you're shooting at 2.8. If you have an f1.4 lens, lucky you, shoot at f1.4, right? You have a 5.6 lens, shoot at 5.6, wide open. So that is across the board what you're going to do. So you can like literally put in your notes for all astrophotography, use wide open apertures, okay? ISO, what's the rule there? What do we want to, what do we want to consider when we think of ISO? We don't want it, we want it essentially what, as low as possible. Now, is there anything stopping us from raising it up a lot? No, but you will get what? Noise. You will be battling noise. So with ISO, my general rule of thumb is as low as possible. That's kind of what I want to go with. And that's true for pretty much all of photography, right? You always want to make sure your ISO is as low as it can be. Shutter speed, though, is the crucial one. Because here's the deal. With star points, if you do not have a tracking mount, and even if you do have a tracking mount, if your shutter speed is too slow, what's going to happen? Your stars are going to trail. Right? You're going to get a little bit, instead of having a nice pointy round star, you're going to have slightly blurred stars. And there's nothing sadder than coming home and on the back of your screen, on your camera, all your stars look perfectly pointy and then you put them on the computer and you zoom in and every one of them has a little trail. It's super bummer time. Like you don't want to do that. Okay? So with our shutter speed, we've got to be careful. All right? Now, the 400 rule is here to help battle that. Okay? What we want to do with the 400 rule, and this requires some math, and photographers in general aren't good at math. I got my degree in physics, so I am good at math. I like math, but some people aren't, and that's okay. So let's do it. What we're going to do is we're going to take 400, and we're going to divide it by the full frame equivalent focal length of your lens. Okay, this is simple, people. Okay, If you have a full frame camera, let's say you have a Canon 5D Mark IV, for example, and you put a 70 to 200 millimeter lens on that thing, okay? and you have it zoomed to 200, what is your full frame equivalent focal length? Not trying to trick you, it's 200, right? There's no, a full frame camera has no crop factor, nothing associated with it. So you would have 200 as your focal length. What if you took a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and you put it on a Nikon crop sensor camera? Nikon crop sensor cameras have a 1.5 times crop factor. Your 200 millimeter lens would act like a what? A 300 millimeter lens. So for the 400 rule computation, you would use 300 for that computation. Okay, so you take whatever your lens is acting like, whatever, whether that full frame or crop, whatever it happens to be, whatever your lens is acting like, you take 400 divided by that. And you guys, if it's a zoom lens, it's wherever you have it currently zoomed to, right? If you have it zoomed to 70, you use 70. If you have it zoomed to 300, you use 300. Wherever it's zoomed to, is what you're going to use that for. We'll go through some examples in a second, but people always get a little baffled by that. All right, so let's try this. All right, what we're going to get, and this is key, the result of this is the longest shutter speed you can use in seconds without seeing star trails, without seeing any trailing in your photos. Now, 
Does anyone learn the 500 rule back in the day? Anyone remember the 500 rule? Okay, before that there was the 600 rule. It's kind of funny they keep lowering the number. The reason is digital cameras keep getting better and better and the resolutions get higher and higher. And back in the day, in the film days, the 500 rule was fine because they weren't high enough resolution photos to see the trailing. But now that we have digital cameras, we need to do the 400 rule. In a year or two or five, we'll have the 300 rule, right? They'll just keep stepping it down to move with the with thing. So let's look at this, all right? Now it's obviously better to go shorter than this if possible because that makes sense. You get less blurring or no blurring for sure. But let's look at an example, all right? So if we have a 16 millimeter lens, let's say we're doing a nice wide shot of you know, some pretty landscape with the Milky Way. If we take 400 and we divide it by 16. Now, you guys, if I'm doing 400 divided by 16, what assumption am I instantly making here? What type of camera am I using? A full frame camera, right? If I had a 16 millimeter lens on a Nikon camera that was a 1.5 crop factor, it would look like a what? 24, right? So I would be taking 400 divided by 24 instead of 400 divided by 16, okay? So we take 400 divided by 16 if we're on a full frame camera, and that gives us 25 seconds. Okay, so this needs to be crystal clear. If I used an, a shutter speed, and again, this is all about shutter speed, this whole calculation. If I used a shutter speed of 30 seconds with a 16 millimeter lens, what would my resulting image look like? Trails. It'd have trails. Right? What if I used 24 seconds? I'm good, no trails, right? So you need to be shorter than the result of this equation. That's the whole goal. Now, is it a perfect science? No, because it also depends where on the sky you're pointing. Remember I told you guys if you point toward the north or the south celestial poles, there's less movement. So you might be able to go to 30, 40 seconds if you're pointing close to the poles. Whereas if you're pointing right at the equator, at the celestial equator, it might be more like 20 seconds. This is an average rule. It's not perfect. So don't blame me if it doesn't work for you sometime. It's not my fault. I didn't come up with it. So if you want landscape in the foreground, yeah. then you definitely are taking that 20 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, wait, what was the, sorry, Andy was signaling to me at the same time. So if you want landscape in the foreground, yeah. Exactly, you need the landscape to be in as well. Yeah, yeah. you guys, if you have landscape in the frame, um, you still gotta stick with the 25. It's no matter what, you, anytime you have stars in the frame and you don't want the stars to blur, you've gotta stick with the 400 rule. That's kind of the generic rule of it, all right? So, what it means is what I just told you. <laughs> Here's some examples, all right? This is up, um, up Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, the big telescopes are up there. And I, when I first saw this image, I was like, sweet, a satellite went by or a plane went by. And then I realized this is actually super nerdy and I love this stuff. Um, again, I got my degree in astrophysics, which was awesome. But this is actually one of the adaptive optics lasers from one of the telescopes on the summit of the mountain, pointing at the atmosphere and correcting for atmospheric disturbances for the big telescopes. I saw this and I was like midway through getting my degree and I was like, yes, like this is so cool, right? We can also see that's the Andromeda galaxy, that galaxy I was talking about earlier in the night, the, the good first starting galaxy, that little fuzzy blob, that's your Andromeda galaxy. It's pretty cool. Here's another one. This is in Death Valley, and you can see stars are nice and pointy. Now, notice, you guys probably can't see super close, but in the corners, my stars aren't nice and pointy, but they are in the center. What's that tell us? What do you think that tells us? That's actually a problem with my lens. Not all lenses, you guys know lenses get blurrier as you move closer to the edges of the glass. That's what's happening here. That's something called coma. And it's turning my little stars into what look like comets toward the edges of the frame. And that's just, there's nothing I can do about it. That's just the fact of having a lens that does that. There's no way around it. A Couple more, right? So here we have more of a wide field shot, but again, our stars are nice and pointy. There's a little bit of nebulosity right there. They're actually, I think, is the Andromeda galaxy again, little tiny fuzzy blob down at the bottom. That thing will be in all your photos. Like if you're pointing anywhere where it's there, it's so bright that it'll be there. It's pretty awesome. This is a mosaic of three images. This was like my first Milky Way shot that didn't even really get the Milky Way. I was really happy about it. So there it is, you guys get to see it. All right, so you guys, let's think about this. Let me review really quickly before we move on. If you wanna get some really pretty wide field Milky Way shot, all you need to do is put your 
aperture wide open, obviously, okay? Set your shutter speed to whatever the 400 rule dictates, whether that's 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it happens to be. And then adjust your ISO either up or down to correct the exposure. Now you guys, here's the thing. I wish I could magically tell you that ISO 800 is perfect all the time or ISO 6400 is perfect all the time. It's really for me a get out there and guess and check kind of situation. If you think about it, if you have a 25 second exposure, how long is it going to take you to guess and check? Probably like five minutes, right? You just take a picture, try ISO 200, up it to 400, take another picture. Five minutes later, you have a proper exposure. So there's no real right answer there. Just guess and check through your ISOs. Start low, work high. As soon as you get something that works, keep it. You're good to go. All right, and obviously if it's getting darker as you're shooting, you might have to adjust throughout the night. But that's really all there is to it. Milky Way stuff simple. All right, so, <laughs> you ready? Yes. You can do that without having something that you need in the film, right? Um, yes, because you are, um, what do you mean? Well, I mean, to, um, you don't have to have one of those devices. That you Not if you are following the 400 rule, right? Not if your shutter speed is shorter than 400 divided by your focal length. That's what that's fighting. Yeah, so you guys, if you, uh, if you don't want to buy a tracker, and you don't want to have anything that's moving the tracking, tracking the night sky, which we'll talk about in a minute why you would want that. But if you don't want to buy one of those, if you follow the 400 rule, your stars will be pointy. That's the idea of that. Yes? Have you ever tried auto aligning? Multiple? Yeah, I've tried it a little bit. Um, there's actually a really good program out for it. I don't remember what it's called. There's one that just came out that's like supposedly like the current thing with Milky Way photography. Mm -hmm. Um, it only works on Mac, and I don't remember quite what it's called. I'll put it in the, if you guys look, check, those of you in here, check back in the video description. I'll put it down on the YouTube video in the description. Those of you watching live, I'll do it like tomorrow. I'll find it and put it up there. Um, but there's a really awesome one, and I've never tried that one, but I tried the old ones in the past that didn't work very well. Andy. The one that you were in the question. Yes. The ones on YouTube. I was, except for that last one. Yeah, you guys, the questions was, do I stack uh, multiple images together, multiple Milky Way images together? All right. So, now for the real stuff. Enough of that lame, plain Jane night photography. Let's do the real good stuff, okay? So, let's switch gears to real astrophotography. Now again, real astrophotography, as I call it, different than other people, but this is really coming in close on one object or another in the sky. Now you all, what still is gonna hold true exposure-wise when we start coming in closer on objects. Motion. motion for sure. We'll still have motion to play with, right? We'll still have our aperture. We'll probably still want to be wide open, right? Our ISO probably still as low as possible. And what about the 400 rule? Probably the same thing, right? If we're still trying to, all essentially we're doing now when we transition into real astrophotography is putting a longer lens on our camera, right? We're getting in a little bit closer. All the other rules are going to stay mostly the same. So we'll look at that. It gets kind of exciting. It gets really exciting. All right, so let's start by assuming you don't want to buy any additional equipment. You're just going to sit here and you'll be like, nope, I don't want to spend thousands. It's, it's a downward spiral, people, okay? <laughs> as soon as you buy one of those, those trackers, you really want that tracker. And as soon as you buy that tracker, you really want the $5,000 tracker. And then like soon you've spent like 20 grand on astrophotography. I have not spent that much, but you could. Uh, and your images, honestly, like I've seen, and this is really cool, I've seen people create images with a very basic $300 tracker that are as good, if not better, than people using a $3,000 tracker. It's all how much time, how much experience you want to put into it. It's kind of like with photography. It's not the camera that makes the photographer, it's the photographer. Same deal. But you will have a little bit of mount envy once you start doing this, for sure. Like, it's, it's going to happen. All right? So let's take a look. Astrophotography without a tracking mount. All right? So here's the guy, thing. What, what we're going to focus on shooting is not planets, not the moon, not the sun, because those things are kind of niche areas of astrophotography in my eyes. I want to mostly focus on nebulas and galaxies and, and stars. Those are kind of my main things uh, that I like to shoot and that I think most people start with. Well, there's a cool name for these, which is deep sky objects. You guys will see that all over the internet if you start doing more of this. Nebulas, galaxies, and like globular clusters, like little star constellations, are in general referred to as deep sky objects. And the cool thing is they're big. They're really big. So if you have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, which is what I use for a lot of what I do, 
you can get really good results. Even at 70 millimeters, you can get really cool astrophotos. So super doable, but you got to pick the largest ones. There are obviously lots of deep sky objects that are super tiny and you need like a 2000 millimeter telescope to tackle those. We can't do that without specialized equipment. So focusing on the biggest ones is very important. All right, we'll talk about that. With a long lens and a tripod, you can totally do it. Obviously, you have to have a tripod, something to stabilize yourself. But really, that's about it. You can do some really cool stuff. All right. Now, what we do is this. And this is where things get really cool. What you need to do to take a really good astro photo is you need to shoot the object that you're interested in for a very long time. Because essentially what's happening is, if you guys think about it, if you've got your sky, your background sky, say, you know, most background skies in astrophotos are black or dark gray, right? You've got the background sky. The object that you're interested in is almost as dark as the sky, like very, very close to the same brightness of the sky. And I'm talking more about galaxies and nebulas. Now, obviously, stars are much brighter than the sky, but most things we're shooting are very dim against the sky. And the thing is, with one picture, if you were to take like one two second photo of that area of the sky. Two seconds is not enough time for many more photons from the object you're interested in, light from the object that you're interested in, to hit the sensor than the light from the sky, from just the background sky hit your sensor. You really have to shoot for longer durations to make the difference between the background sky and the object you're interested in start to separate a little bit. Otherwise, you're just counting the sky and the object as the same thing. So the longer we can get our shutter speed, the more that background is going to pull away from the object we're interested in. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Now here's the thing. If we use the 400 rule with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, and let's say we're on a full frame camera, what do we get? If we take it, say we have a 200 millimeter lens and we use the 400 rule, what's the longest shutter speed we could use? two seconds. Is that a lot of time? No, that's not a lot of time at all. And in two seconds, if you think about it, you take a picture of what you are told by smart people is this like beautiful spiral galaxy. And you take a picture of it. I just drew a potato on the board, but that's a galaxy. All right, look, it's got a spiral. Ooh, all right, cool. You're shooting your little spiral galaxy, you know, like those images that I showed at the beginning, right? If you shoot this for two seconds, right? Let's say that like 10 little units of light hit your sensor right here during those two seconds. And let's say that only 11 hit your sensor from here. So that's only one unit of light brighter than the background sky. Well, think about it. If you go down to one second, that's only five and 5.5. You guys see how it's even closer together? The difference between the object we want and the sky is even less. So what you can start to see is as you lengthen your exposure time, the difference, like I was saying, the difference between what you want and the background sky increases. And that's what we're going for. So if we are limited to a two second exposure, what can we do? How do we get around this? We shoot a ton of these photos. Okay, so let's think about that. If we keep shooting two second exposure after two second of exposure after two second exposure of the same object in the sky again and again and again and again, what's going to start happening? Those objects are going to start to separate apart. We're going to start to see differences between the galaxy that we're interested in and the background sky because that's the way this works, shooting shot after shot after shot after shot. Now, how many is, is enough? This is always the question people ask me. I love this. OK, you guys, what this is called is integrating photos. It's called image integration. And it's something that scientists use. It's something that astrophotographers use. What we like to talk about in astrophotography is something called integration time, which is if you took all of the exposures that you put into an image and you added up the amount of time taken in every single exposure, What's the total amount of time you shot that object for, right? So let's say you shot four 30-second exposures of an object, and you put them all together in Photoshop. What would the integration time be of that? Two minutes. You'd call that a two-minute integration time. Okay. To give you a little perspective, 
many of the best astrophotos are over 100 hours of integration time. Okay, over 100 hours of integration time. So if you think about that, if we have 100 hours, there's 60 minutes in an hour, right? That's 6,000, right? No, yes, 6,000 minutes of integration time. You multiply that by 60 to get how many seconds that is, that's a lot of time, okay? Now, that's for many of the dimmer objects that you're gonna be doing that for. For you guys, when you're shooting a bright object like the Andromeda Galaxy, if you could get 30, 40, 50 minutes of integration time, that'd be awesome. If you can get 10 minutes of integration time, that'd be awesome. There's no golden rule. Essentially, you wanna get as much as you can stand getting. That's kind of the, uh, the idea, okay? So, let me give you an example. Let's say that you wanna start by shooting the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, that's a great bet. Andromeda's up in this part of the world all night, every night throughout the entire year. It's always above the horizon. Um, it's circumpolar, so it's always available to shoot. It's a great bright object, and I would say if you guys were gonna go out and try to start, you would want to maybe get 10 minutes of Andromeda time, 10 minutes of integration time, okay? So let's say that that's our goal. We wanna get 10 minutes of time. So let me write that on the board. All right, so we're going for 10 minutes of integration time. And let's say that we can use one second exposures. Okay, let's say we only have one second exposures because we're gonna use a 400 millimeter lens to shoot Andromeda. Okay, so we have one second exposures. How many pictures do we need to take? 600, exactly, we can take 600 images. So you guys, <laughs> I love this stuff. All right, so that literally means you're out there on your tripod, you point at Andromeda, you set your shutter speed to one second. What do you set your aperture to? Wide open. What do you set your ISO to? Whatever it needs to be. We're gonna talk about exposing in a little bit. I'll kind of give you guys some guidelines on where to put it, where to get that exposure set to. But let's say we set our ISO magically and you set your shutter speed to one second. You're gonna go click, Click and preferably use a cable release so you're not bouncing your camera each time you push it, each time you push the button. Click, 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 click. What's going to happen as you're doing that? Andromeda is going to move out of the frame, right? So every so often you're going to need to look through the viewfinder and be like, oh, all right, recenter it, loosen the tripod, move it over. Click, 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 click for like another, you know, five minutes. Look back, reposition, click, click, click again and again and again until you've taken what? 600 frames, until you've gotten enough of the images to make it work. Does that make sense, you guys, at its core? All right, questions so far? So how long would it take to shoot 600 images? Well, if they're one second long, 600 seconds, but you gotta give a little bit of a break. So, you know, 20 minutes, you're out there for 20 minutes, not, not a crazy amount of time, okay? But is it particularly enjoyable? No, it depends if you like cold nights or, you know, being out in the stars. I personally think it's kind of relaxing to fire shot after shot after shot. But you guys, that's what we're doing. We're essentially taking a 10 minute exposure made up of little one second chunks. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Now, let me give you before I forget one other really good target to start with. Okay, Andromeda Galaxy is one thing. The second thing would be the Orion Nebula. Most people know the Orion constellation. It's, you know, Orion's belt. You see the three little belt stars. In Orion's dagger down on his belt, which Orion is coming up at the perfect time this time of year, it's rising right as the sun sets, it's up perfectly. Right on Orion's dagger, there are a bunch of little nebulas. There's like a whole cluster of nebulas. And if you just point your camera up there, I promise, it's very cool. You point your camera up there and you take like a two second exposure, whatever the 400 rule says, of that little area, you'll be blown away with how many cool nebulas you'll see in that area. That's another great place to start because it's on the dagger, which right next to the belt, it's very easy to find that target without any sort of extra aid, okay? So we're integrating our exposures through time, all right? This is only possible for the brighter ones, and this is the bummer of it. I showed you guys that uh, shot of the Whirlpool galaxy earlier tonight, that really pretty spiral galaxy. That galaxy is so dim that during a two second exposure, you would basically not see it. It would just be the exact same brightness as the background sky. So even if you shot like 10, 20, 30,000 one second exposures, it's not bright enough to separate at all, even when you add all of those up. So there's limits to this, obviously. It's not gonna work for even the dimmest objects 
or astronomers would not buy trackers. There'd be no reason for it. Okay, so it only worked for the brighter ones. But you guys, if you own a 200 millimeter lens, or even a 70 millimeter lens, and a camera, and you have a tripod, go try this. It's awesome. Like, so many people see this, and I see them sitting in here nodding, like, yeah, that's cool. And then I ask them a week later, did you try it? Go try it. It's awesome. Like, it's going to work for you, especially in the winter when it gets dark at like five. You have no excuse. Uh, it, it's totally worth it. Like, go, go try these things. All right? Now, here's a big thing. You have to know the sky, OK? You guys, I have an unfortunate story for you. People who spend more money on mounts, uh, on big tracking mounts, you get something called go-to when you spend a lot of money on a mount. And what that means is I can basically, in my, at my home, my home uh, telescope mount, I can type in go-to the Andromeda galaxy. And the telescope goes and like points directly at it for me. I don't have to like kind of look through it and look down the lens and do all these crazy things to do that. So if you don't have a tracker, you have to know the sky. And that's why I think Andromeda and Orion are so simple, because most people can find them with just the naked eye. It's a pretty easy target to find. OK? Yeah? Ah, that's a great question. Um, something you can fit like, uh, yeah, you guys, a good, a good memory card. Thanks for repeating. Yeah, I got to repeat the questions. Um, a good size memory card to start off with if you're getting into astrophotography is something you can get, what, a thousand images on, something like that. You really want to be able to not worry about it because you guys just saw you might need 600 images in a night uh, of one object. If you want to do multiple objects, that's 600 of each, so enough space for a lot of photos. I also shoot raw for everything because uh, I never know whether I want it. You get a lot of astro photos really fast. Um, to give you guys a little perspective, the average astro photo that I shoot that's a final processed image is around about 100 gigabytes of size, including all the processing files, all the extra files that go into it. 100 gigabytes, 200 gigabytes, something like that. So if you buy a one terabyte hard drive, that's going to fit between 5 and 10 finished astro photos on it. You fill space fast. It's just the way of it. Um, but hard drives are cheap these days. You can get a one terabyte hard drive for like 50 bucks now. Can't complain about that, right? They're cheap. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the steps involved with doing this and how, how we're going to go through the steps, OK? So first thing is, you need to plan this out. And this is true whether you have a mount or don't have a mount, whatever it happens to be. You need to make a plan. Because I've gone out so many nights, and I've been like, I'm going to do some astrophotography. And I get my mount out and hike it outside. And I'm like, I plan it down. I'm like, well, there's a sky. What do I shoot? Right? You just don't, you don't know. So you definitely need a plan, and we'll talk about that. You also need to get good at finding the target in the field. How do we actually find what we're looking for? There's some little tricks I'll show you guys in a little bit. And we'll go through each of these in detail after I go through all of them kind of broadly. Focusing. This is a big one. Who's taken a blurry astrophoto? Oh, yeah, like good stuff. I'm sure people watching too have taken a blurry astrophoto. How do you focus at night? It's dark, right? Autofocus usually doesn't work. It's pretty hard. So we'll talk about some tricks for that. Exposing. All right, we know what our shutter speed is, we know what our aperture is, but I have some tricks for you guys to set your ISO accurately, which is nice. Now, this is important, and this is getting into something that if you guys want to start off in astrophotography and you want to take it a little bit further, I'm putting some stuff right here that we're not going to talk about tonight, but I urge you, if this is something you want to do, to look at this on your own, because it's very important. When we are shooting, Astrophotographers like to sh talk about shooting two different types of images. The first are called lights. And you guys, a light frame, a light photo, as it's called, is what you'd think. It's a photo of the object you're trying to shoot. That's simple. So you could just think of this instead of saying lights as pictures of the object. Simple. There are also these things called calibration frames. And what calibration frames are, they're not photos of your object. They're actually photos of either the noise in your photo or the vignetting in your images or what's called the bias voltage on your sensor. These guys can be used to improve your light frames. You can use your calibration frames to improve the final result of your photograph. And again, it's a little bit beyond what I want to chat about tonight in this talk. But if you guys are interested, definitely do a little Google search for darks, flats, and biases, because they are very helpful if you're going to go further down the line of astrophotography. Yes? One quick question. The long-term noise reduction on a uh -huh. camera, on or off? I leave it off, um, because I like to do darks, which are kind of your own version of long exposure noise reduction. Yeah, anytime you, you're dealing with long exposure noise reduction, 
Um, it's not for me because you basically, you guys, if you think about it, with long exposure noise reduction, what are you missing out on? If every shot you take, it shoots another frame to, to remove the noise. Sure, you get less noise, but what, what are you missing? Not detail, but double, you basically have to be outside for twice as long, right? It's taking up two times the amount of time to shoot the same number of photos. So if you guys do some looking, darks are a way to do the same thing long exposure noise reduction is doing without having to do it when you're shooting the sky. You can do it on another night or another day or something like that. So that's something to look at for sure. You stack, right? When you get home, you've taken all your frames, you stack them together to turn them into one final photo. And then lastly, you do your editing and your final processing. All right, so let's break these down. Let's talk about planning and what's involved with the planning phase of astrophotography. All right, here's some software programs that I would recommend you guys look at, okay? It's really nice when you're planning a shoot to be able to open up a planetarium program on your computer and look around at the sky at what it's gonna look like the night that you're planning on shooting. So if you're on Mac or Windows, the one I would recommend is Stellarium. It's awesome, it's free, it works on both platforms, it even works on Linux, it's a great program. And what you can do is download Stellarium and tell Stellarium, hey, I live in Missoula, Montana or wherever you happen to live and I'm going out tonight so I wanna see what the stars will look like tonight at eight o'clock and you type that into Stellarium and it shows you everything that's gonna be looking at in Missoula at eight o'clock tonight. It's very, very cool. And you can even go in and tell it like, I only wanna see the brightest objects or I only wanna see the dimmest objects. You can do all this kind of customization to it. Um, for those of you guys watching live, it's actually, there's a link to Stellarium down in the video description. So the, for you guys in here, if you click on this video once you guys leave here tonight, there's a link down there you can click on it and get right to Stellarium. SkyX is another one. It costs, I think, like three or $400, but it has a lot more stars than Stellarium does. So if you're interested in like getting the really best and having all of the objects, that's what I would go with. And Voyager is another one that has more objects as well. So Stellarium is really what I would recommend. And you guys, basically what I would do is just look around and <laughs> look for one of these suitable objects. So let's talk about what we're looking for. I've already given you two, Andromeda and the Orion Nebula but there's some other things I can help with. What you wanna do is stick to what's called the Messier or the NGC catalog. Now those sound super fancy and nerdy, and they are, uh, but basically those are just names of catalogs of objects. So the Messier catalog, named after the astronomer, um, he basically went around and categorized uh, or named a bunch of objects in the sky, and he called them the Messier objects. They happen to be very bright and usually easy to photograph, which is awesome. So if you find a Messier object, they always start with M, capital M, like M31 or M1 or M2. If you see an object like that, there's a good bet that you with a DSLR would be able to capture an image of it. Okay, so Messier is good. And then NGC, those are, that's another good set um, of objects that you can shoot. There are some much dimmer ones in the NGC catalog, so you gotta be a little careful there. All right, now, this gets confusing. You want to look at the object's magnitude, and all um, programs that are planetarium programs will give you the magnitude of the object. Magnitudes are inversed, so the lower the magnitude, the brighter the object is. So you want magnitudes of lower than six. So six, five, really you won't find anything lower than that. So six or five for what you guys are going to be looking at, okay? And that means that you get brighter objects. Like I think the magnitude of the fold of the sun at noon is like negative 31 or something, right? It's like incredibly bright. We're looking at, you know, sixes, fives, maybe a seven if you're really daring and you want to be out there for three hours, but you get the idea. All right, larger objects are great. So <clears throat> this is where you can start to see, and, and you guys, this all sounds kind of foreign. When you get into Stellarium or Skyax or Voyager, all of these things are laid out for you. It explains all this stuff. It tells you what it all is. You want to find something that has one degree of angular size. Now, what that means is, if you all think about it, if you've got the sky and let's say you're standing in like the salt flats, so the horizon is perfectly straight in all directions, right? Or maybe like the North Pole, so you've got like flat ice in all directions, no mountains. How many degrees from this side of me to the other side of me? 180, right? And if I turn this way, 180 that way. So one degree of angular size means 
that it takes up one square degree chunk on the sky. So one one eightieth in this direction and one one eightieth in this direction, a nice big chunk of sky. Anything that size or bigger is gonna be well suited for a 70 to 200 millimeter lens or something that we all, not all, but a lot of us commonly own. Um, 70 to 300, something like that. So nice big objects, a little easier. All right. Objects are also high in the sky are usually preferred. Why is that? Atmosphere. atmosphere. Okay, you guys. We talked about the very beginning shooting planetary astronomy or astrophotography. The thing you're battling is the atmosphere. The higher something is, the less atmosphere you have to shoot through to shoot it. So when you're trying to shoot the Orion Nebula, and I told you guys it's rising as soon as the sun sets, be smart to wait an hour or two till it's gotten kind of high in the sky so you're not shooting it right on the horizon. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, you shoot through much less atmosphere that way, and that's a good thing. All right, now let's move on to the next step, finding the target in the field. Okay, astronomers, I had a professor in, in college who said that a lot of astronomy is pattern recognition. That's what you're trying to do is recognize patterns. What I like to do, if I'm trying to find something pretty dim, is in Stellarium, you can print a little star chart of the stars around the object you're looking for. Now, what you want to do is print out a piece of paper, and yes, you actually want to print it. I, like, I always have people ask me, like, Ooh, what about my smartphone app? Don't look at a screen of a smartphone when you're trying to find a dim object. It doesn't work outside, right? You're like looking at this bright screen, you look up, you're like, I can't see anything, right? It doesn't work. So print out a piece of paper, that has the bright stars around the object you're looking for. And then what I like to do is look up at the sky and try to find where that star pattern lies, where those stars are. And you, come, you gotta rotate the piece of paper sometimes to find a lineup, but find something. And then what I do is I point my camera that direction and I put my camera on live view, right? The little live view mode where it should, the screen displays what the lens is seeing. Reason being is when you're looking through the viewfinder of the camera, things are really dim and hard to see. But if you use the live view screen on the back, it's much brighter, much easier, and you can see the dim stars a lot, a lot easier. So that helps you get centered and get it, get it all aligned. But printing off a star chart, super important, and trying to find those patterns. Okay? If you have a zoom lens, also zoom out as much as you can when you put it on live view, because then you can see as many stars around the object as possible. Getting things centered is quite hard sometimes. All right, with live view, you guys, this is important. Your live view settings, how bright your live view preview is, is determinant entirely on what your current camera settings are. So when I switch over to live view, I always put it on my highest ISO, my slowest shutter speed, and a wide open aperture. Now, am I gonna shoot it like this? No, I'm just doing this for framing the image. I'm just getting that live view picture as bright as possible for framing and getting everything aligned the way I want it to be. All right? Use an app, use a star chart, find a recognizable pattern in the vicinity of your target and line things up. All right? I like to look down the barrel of the lens, can't like kind of like put my eye a lot, I do a lot of like this, get my eye right to the side of the lens so I can look down the length of the lens, try to get things aligned. Okay, last, this is what the pros do. They use a finder scope. Now, finder scopes look like a little mini telescope that you put on your telescope, usually a little small telescope attached to your big telescope. DSLR world, you can get one of these. Uh, so an actual like red dot sight from like a rifle or a, or a handgun, like an actual gun sight, they make mounts that let you mount those to the hot shoe of your camera. Now what that does, you guys, is this projects a little red dot onto the center of that little window that you look through. And you can align this thing so that whatever the little red dot is on, that's where your lens is pointing. And that makes it really easy to align things perfectly. These can be had for like 40, 50 bucks. Highly recommended if you're gonna do a lot of this. It really helps you get things aligned quickly. Pretty cool little trick. Uh, a red dot site or a red dot finder, a lot of different names for them. Um, and if you go on like B&H's website or um, 
there's a lot of websites that sell them, but B&H would have them for sure. They'll have little mounts that let you take your hot shoe and you slide the little mount into your hot shoe and then it lets you put a red dot finder on that little mount. Makes it super easy. Yeah. It's called a red dot finder. All right. Focusing. This is hard. Here's an example of a blurry photo. <laughs> Isn't that pretty, you guys? Hey, but guess what? Are my stars round? I used the 400 rule perfectly. Uh, does it matter? No, right? Everything's super blurry. This, unfortunately, looked great on the back of my camera. I was like, oh man, I got that focus nailed. And then I got home and I was like, what is that? <laughs> That's just terrible, all right? You gotta make sure your focus is set. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that. The nice thing is when I'm focusing, I actually use the same live view settings as when I was framing the image. I use the same exact live view settings, meaning the live view preview is as bright as possible in the screen. So you want, essentially, when you're focusing, you want to use live view. Live view is going to help you out a lot. All right? Manual focus. I have not found a camera yet today that can adequately and consistently focus on a star. It just doesn't work. It's very hard for the focus to do that. There are telescopes that do it, but cameras just aren't cut out for that. So you want to make sure you're on manual focus. All right? Turn that focus ring, and what you're looking for is there's going to be a certain point in your focusing where the stars look small, and that's what you want to go for. When you're in live view, the stars, and you, you'll turn the ring. Those of you who've done this, you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll turn that focus ring, and the stars will get be big and fuzzy, and they'll get smaller, and then as you go past focus, they get bigger again. And you want to do that a few times, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, and work your way until you get the smallest possible star. Now, I need to be honest with you guys. One of the big reasons people buy telescopes is because telescopes have really nice focusers attached to them. It's one of the big advantages of a telescope over a camera lens. Camera lenses, their focus is very coarse. It's very rough adjustment. Telescopes have very fine tuning focus. So this is a little bit frustrating. You're gonna go back and forth a lot of times. The way to know, get it as close as you can and then make sure on live view you hit the zoom in button and you can actually digitally zoom into that preview on the back of your camera and make sure that that star is as small as possible. So make sure you're utilizing that. Also, take a test shot if you need to. Just take a test picture and uh, check it out, see what it looks like. All right, now, gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape is awesome. It's a photographer's best friend. It's like duct tape, but it doesn't leave residue and it's black, and it's awesome, and it's non-reflective. Every gaffer uses it, it's amazing. I like to bring gaffer's tape with me out in the field, and as soon as I've got my focus where I want it, I take a little piece of gaffer's tape and I tape down my focus ring. Because I can't tell you how many times I get everything set, it's all focused, and I point at my object, and I mean to hit the zooming ring, and I hit the focus ring, and I lose my focus, and then I gotta do it all over again. So I really like to gaff tape down that focus ring so it doesn't move. Super crucial. Now, temperature compensation. What do you think that means? What are lenses made of? Usually glass, yeah, what, but the, the material that the outside is is usually metal, right? Metal or plastic. Metal for a nicer lens. What happens to metal as it heats and cools? It expands and contracts a little bit. There's a little bit of expansion or contraction. Okay, I'm not kidding you. During the course of a night, if you take your lens out from a hot house and you put it out in a cold winter night in Montana, if you focus when that lens is warm, is room temperature, and you get your focus locked down, as that lens starts to cool down to the ambient temperature outside in the world, you will be pulled out of focus. It will, it will mess with your focus. So make sure you're checking this routinely. Every maybe 10, 20, 30 frames, get on live view, check again, make sure your focus is perfect. It's gonna be a constantly checked process because um, that temperature will do it. In fact, really, really nice telescopes are made out of carbon fiber because carbon fiber does not change size as much with temperature. So you don't have to do this. Fancy things. Spend three grand on a telescope and you don't have to adjust your focus midway through the night. Look at that. All right. You want to find a bright star when you do this. Brightest star, the better. Um, honestly, stars are all the same distance away as far as the camera's concerned. So if you focus on one star and you shoot a completely different star, it doesn't matter. The, the focus is going to be the same regardless of where you point. All right. 
exposing. OK, I say it's all about that ISO. Why? Because we know what our aperture is going to be, and we know what our shutter speed is going to be. Our shutter speed is going to be 400 rule. Our uh, aperture is going to be wide open. So really, our ISO is all we have to go off of. All right. So we know these two things. All right. And I have another example in here for shutter speed where I say that if we have a 200 millimeter lens, 400 rule divided by 200 is two seconds. Simple. All right. That's review. Aperture, we know we're wide open. So let's talk about ISO. OK. What you're looking for, you guys, what's the majority of the photo going to be in the image? What's, the major what's going to be the most of what's in your picture? Black sky, right? Dark sky. What do we want to make sure we don't do? What do you think? We don't want to block up the sky. We don't want the sky to go pure black. Because if the sky goes pure black, a lot of photographers call it clipping. You clip the blacks in the photo, meaning black without detail. If you do that, you're losing information. And that's not a good thing. So what you want to do is you want to adjust your ISO until your histogram looks something like this. You guys see that massive spike? What do you think that is? That's your back sky. That's your background sky. And you want to make sure that your histogram, and that's something to look at when you're shooting, is for sure have your histogram up. You want to make sure that your histogram is not touching the left-hand side. That's the crucial part. Because if that histogram is slammed up against the left-hand side, that means you're losing information in your blacks. It means essentially you're throwing away pixels that are uh, important to you. Okay. So what I do? I do the old highly advanced guess and check technique, where I literally start at 800. I take a picture. I look at the histogram. If it's touching the left, I go to 1600. And I keep increasing that until my histogram looks something like that. OK? Pretty simple. And I walk through it here. Goal is to get the majority of the information in the midtones and the shadows. All right. ISO is going to completely depend on two things, light pollution and moon phase. This is important. OK. Why? Why does it depend on light? Let's talk about light pollution. What's light pollution going to do for us or against us? What do you guys think? Yeah, it's going to definitely give your sky a color cast. right? If you look up in the sky in Missoula at the, in the middle of the night, the sky looks orange. It just does. right? What else is it going to do for you? It's going to brighten the sky. right? It's going to make everything brighter. And that is going to really hurt you when you're trying to get that really dim object to be pulled away from the dark background. Because if you make the background brighter, the, the contrast between those two things goes way, way down. So you guys, if you're going to do real astrophotography, especially if you're not going to buy a mount or something like that, Getting to a really dark sky is really important. If you can drive you know, 15, 20, 30 miles outside of Missoula or wherever you happen to live, do that. Um, because it really, you're going to be fighting a battle trying to do it here in like downtown Missoula. It's not going to work very well. What about moon phase? Same thing, right? Same thing. The fuller the moon, the more sky brightness there is. I'm going to be honest with you guys. If you're not going to buy a tracking mount and you're just going to do this with your, the gear you have, which you should definitely try, don't do it on a full moon night. In fact, I would really only do it on a new moon or one or two days before or after the new moon. I think the new moon was like three or four days ago. So right now is what? Is it today? Mm, awesome. All right. The new moon's today. Go out tonight, get some shots. I think it's cloudy, but whatever. Just imagine the clouds not being there. They will go away. Um, no, if you, if you guys are watching live, those of you who are watching live, go shoot tonight if it's clear. Like, it's, a great, it's a great time to do it. The, the new moon is perfect because there's none of that light pollution. Um, and you all, even Missoula is a mid-sized town. Even uh, 10 miles outside of town, the amount of light pollution goes way, way, way down uh, compared to in town. So you don't have to go very far. Just find yourself some national forest land and go out there and you know, pull off the side of the road and spend an hour shooting, and you'll be surprised what you get. It's pretty, pretty cool. All right? But that definitely plays a part in what your exposure will be. All right, more light pollution equals lower ISO, obviously, because there's more available light. All right, now, I should mention this. There are really cool filters that smarter people than I have made to cut down on light pollution. Here's the cool thing, and I'm going to go into this for like a minute because it's super nerdy and it's my duty 
to nerd out with you guys. Even if you're not going to do it with me, I'm going to tell you anyway. All right? Lights, city lights emit light in very specific wavelengths, very specific colors. Like when you look up at the sky, someone said things look very orange in Missoula. That's because the street lights Missoula uses are very orange. In Hawaii, they use special street lights because the telescopes are up there that look very yellow. They don't interfere as much with what the telescopes are doing up there. It's pretty cool. Long story short, those lights are very consistent around the world. A lot of lights use the same colors. All city lights, a lot of city lights are the same colors. So what companies do is they build these little filters that you screw on either the front of your lens or the very front of your mirror, right in front of your mirror before you put the lens on. They're called a clip-in filter. And what they do is they allow all wavelengths of light to pass through that filter except for the common wavelengths that city lights emit in. So essentially, as far as your camera is concerned, it's in a beautiful dark sky location. Even though you can see all this light pollution, the camera can't see it. And that helps a lot if you're always shooting in Missoula or something like that, or a big city. So those are pretty cool. They're like three or $400, but they're cool, okay? They're definitely an investment. All right, shooting. Shooting lights. You guys, this is simple. We've gone through this. I just want to do it again real quick. Some little settings. I would put my mirror, if you have a DSLR camera, on mirror lockup mode. What that means is before each frame, we all know in our DSLRs we have a little mirror that flops up before each picture is taken. Like the mirror flops up and then the shutter opens and closes, and that takes the photo. If you put it on mirror lockup mode, when you click the button, the mirror locks up about a second before the shutter opens and closes. And what that does for you is it ensures there's less camera shake. So if your camera has the option, I would put it on mirror lockup. If you have a mirrorless camera, one of the newer mirrorless cameras, you don't need to worry about that because there is no mirror. It's literally called a mirrorless camera. All right, so there's no reason to do that. Cable release or self timer, for sure. I really vote cable release because waiting for a 10 second self timer every time you want to take one of 600 photos, not fun. Okay, cable release, you can just go like bam, 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 do them quick. Center the object, shoot a series of images, reposition, and repeat. And that's literally what you're going to do. Center, shoot, reposition. Center, shoot, reposition. Now you're going to start to learn that the object will always move in one certain direction. So instead of centering it, you could intentionally off-center it opposite of the direction it's going to move so you have a longer time before you have to reposition it. You can start to do that. But that's really what you're doing. Recentering, shooting, repeating. Okay. Aim for around 30 to 60 minutes of images. I just told you guys 10 minutes earlier. That's a great benchmark for something like Andromeda or the Orion Nebula. But as you start to get to dimmer and dimmer objects, more time, the better. Um, I will shout out to one of our past summer intensive and professional intensive students. Um, I had a guy a couple years ago who wanted to do astrophotography. He took something like 1,200 images of this one object, and he was out there shooting every single frame. And then when he got to aligning them, which we'll talk about in a minute, he literally took the time to click the same star in all 1,200 photos. And that's something that you have to go through. And his image at the end was really pretty. It was worth the effort. But like you, it, this stuff takes time. It definitely does. So you got to be ready to do that. All right. Integration. All right, when you're all done shooting, you'll be doing that integration and you'll add up all of those different exposures and put them into one. All right, now shooting calibration frames. This is all I'm going to talk about this, okay? Calibration frames will have a huge impact on your resulting images. And remember, that's those things called darks, flats, and biases. That this is all you're going to get on those. Read about them if you want to. Basically, what they are is you're shooting images of nothing. Uh, as an example, Taking a dark frame, what you do is you put your lens cap on and you take a picture of your lens cap. It's super exciting. Uh, a flat frame, you actually put a t-shirt over your lens and take a picture of a t-shirt. Like, there's these weird things, okay? Like I said, there's three tarps, darks, flats, and bias. All right? Then we stack. We put these together. Okay. Now, stacking is done in software, okay? Stacking is done in software. There are some programs I would recommend. For those of you guys in here, 
Uh, if you watch this video afterward, there is links to all of these software programs down in the description of the video. For those of you guys watching live, you can do it right now. Click on that link in the description and there's links to all this stuff. The first program I would recommend for all of you guys because it's free is Deep Sky Stacker. Now, this program is officially only for PC people. It doesn't work on Mac. But there is this German company. I don't know if it's a company or a dude. A lot of things in like astronomy are just like one man or one woman operations. Like that's the way they do it. I don't know how legit or how unlegit this company is or person is, but there is a person in Germany who has ported Deep Sky Stacker over to Mac. And there's links to both the PC version and the slightly ghetto maybe German version that works on Mac in the description of the video. So it's a great program, it works, it's free. And I have had students use the Mac version with great success. So I have had people use it, I just haven't done it personally, okay? Another one's called Nebulosity. This one's made by a guy named Craig Stark. He's an awesome, um, like I think he's a professor, he's like a neuroscientist or something, but his side hobby is astronomy. And he makes a great program that does stacking. His program costs about $80 though. So you're paying a little bit of a premium, but you get Mac and PC use officially, and it does a better job than Deep Sky Stacker. So that's cool. The third one is Pix Insight. Pix Insight is about $300, and it's basically Photoshop for astrophotographers. It's got everything. It does everything automated. It's, it's beautiful. It like brought a tear to my eye the first time I used it. It's amazing. It's a fantastic program, but you're spending a premium for that. So that's really only an investment if you wanna do this long-term, obviously. But those are three really solid programs to do this, okay? You stack it and then you edit it. And I should say also Nebulosity and Pix Insight also do editing. They're not just stackers. They'll also do some editing aspects as well. But if you guys have Photoshop or even Lightroom, it can do some editing for you too. So no, no worries there. All right, let's look at some examples. That right there is the Orion Nebula. That was shot with about 10 minutes of integration time with a DSLR without a tracking mount in my backyard. All right, so those of you who say you can't do astrophotography, proof, you all can do astrophotography, right? That's about a 200 millimeter lens. And now is it perfect? You guys, if you look closely, there's a lot of noise in here, right? And if I was to shoot this for longer than 10 minutes, go 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, that noise would clear away and everything would look a lot better. But for a start, heck, we're pretty good. Here's the Andromeda Galaxy. And again, that's about 10 minutes, all right? And we're just starting to see, you guys see that spiral arm right there? The other spiral arm right there? You can start to see that spiral detail. And again, with more time and more time and more time, that will start to become even clearer, okay? So definitely, definitely doable. Questions with that? That's the process of taking an astro photo if you don't want to buy any gear, okay? Any questions? All right, what I want to transition to for the next maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up, is what, what you want to do if you do want to buy a little bit of equipment. And, and again, this can be as little or as much as you want to spend. Um, but I recommend for most people who want to do this, setting a budget of around $1,000 for everything that you want to get is a pretty good starting place. You can do it for less for sure, but that's a pretty safe bet that would get you something that you would really be happy with for quite a while. So let's talk about some of the options. All right, first of all, we have telescopes and mounts, and those are kind of the two things people consider buying when they are thinking about doing this, either a, a tracker or a new telescope. Which one do you think is more important? Telescope or mount? Mount. I think the mount's way more important. Because if you guys think about it, what is a 200 millimeter lens? It's a telescope, right? 200 millimeter lens is essentially a telescope. What is a mount that you have in your bag? You don't have one in your bag, right? Like a mount is something that a lot, most people just don't own. So I would definitely spend the time on the mount. Now, let me show you guys what a mount looks like. So this guy, is called, the iOptron is the brand, and it's called the Sky Tracker. It's called the iOptron Sky Tracker. Now what it is, it's very simple. It's just a little motor. And again, let me ask you guys, how often does the stars, do the, do the stars make one full rotation around the sky? 24 hours, okay? Well, there's a little motor in here that turns a gear, and that motor is programmed to rotate the gear around how often do you think? 
once every 24 hours. So what happens is I'm going to loosen this little, this little lock here. But what happens is, and this obviously happens at a much slower pace than what I'm about to do, but the motor turns this axis of the mount just like this. All right, I'm running it. Let me do it this way. This will be easier. It turns this axis of the mount once every 24 hours. It rotates the camera around like that. Okay, now here's the key part. If you guys think about it, if you were standing on the equator of the Earth and you looked due east or due west, all right, right at sunset, so you're standing on the equator, you look due east or due west, and you watch a star, what is that star going to do throughout the night? You watch it for the whole night until the sun rises. It's going to go up straight over your head and set directly behind you. You guys with me so far, right? Because we're on the equator, due east, we pick a star, okay? Think about this. What we do with this little mount is, do you guys see how there's a little scope over here on the side? There's a little scope. This is actually its own little mini telescope, all right? I can see all you guys. All right, little mini telescope. What this is for is, this is key to a mount. And you guys, the type of mount that this is and the type of mount you would want to buy if you bought one is what's called a German equatorial mount, a German equatorial mount. And again, there's links to all this stuff down in the description of the video. But a German equatorial mount is a mount that is calibrated to move with the stars. So let me show you how this works. What you do when you're trying to set this up is you need to find the North Star or the Southern Cross. You need to find the North or South Celestial Pole. And what I do, let's say that it's right up there, magically. It just happened to be where I wanted it to be. And I look through this little scope. And in that scope, you guys, if you buy one of these, you'll see it. There's a little crosshair. And what you do is you actually align that crosshair with either the North Star or the Southern Cross. Now, there's a little app you can get that shows you where to put it specifically, because I told you guys really the North Star is not perfectly on the North Celestial Pole. But you put it where the app tells you to put it. And what that means is that this mount is now perfectly aligned with the pole of the Earth. Does that make sense to you all? Okay. Now here's the cool part. It makes one rotation every, every 24 hours, right? And if we think about it, if the North Pole is that direction, North Celestial Pole, I should be careful, where is the celestial equator from this position, if this is this way? A flat plane out in all directions like this, right? Well, check this out. Look at what axis this rotates on. The exact axis of the celestial equator. So what this means is, once the mount has been aligned to the pole, I can take this little knob on my head, and you guys, this is just a normal tripod head. The way that this works is this mount, it goes right on your tripod, and you take your normal tripod head off of your tripod and you put it on the mount. So all that's needed here is just this little red box. And if you have a tripod and you have a, a head, you can make this little combination here. Now what this does is you can take your camera and you can point it at any star in the sky. So let's like loosen it. Let's say that we want to point like right there. I really like that star. That's actually kind of Polaris. Let's point it right there. Lock everything down. So we choose that we're going to shoot this direction. Okay. Now normally, we would have to see that this is a 50, a 50 millimeter lens, do the 400 rule calculation, figure out what our longest shutter speed is. But instead, we turn this little guy on, you flip a switch, and what's happening in the background so slowly is that this camera is tracking with that object. And if you look through this viewfinder after an hour of tracking with the object, guess what's still in your frame? The object. So whenever we were just talking about how shooting without a tracker You've got to shoot, 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 reposition, shoot, 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 reposition. If you have a tracking mount, you never have to reposition. It keeps the object in the center. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. And there's no need to realign the mount. I can just take the camera, point it at another star. All right. That kind of would be the ground. But imagine that there was a star down there. And the tracker is still going. And it tracks it through the night all the way up as it rises and it sets. And that's really all there is to it. They're amazing little devices. It's just a simple motor that rotates once every 24 hours. That's what it's doing. Now, people always ask me, well, actually, I'm going to ask you guys instead. What does this do for us? Obviously, it eliminates the need to reposition things. But what's the big advantage we're gaining here? What's the big advantage? Reducing blur, true. But what does that allow us to do? 
we can use a longer shutter speed, right? Instead of being chained to the 400 rule, now we can start breaking that 400 rule and using longer and longer and longer shutter speeds because in the duration of the exposure, this will track with it. Now, I just told you guys that this costs $300 and that costs $700. And then you can get one for four or $5,000. Why? What do you think those are letting you do? A nicer and nicer mount. Yeah. Exactly, they have greater precision. They have greater tracking precision. So I happen to know that this camera with maybe a 70 to 200 millimeter lens that we've been using for this whole time, without a tracker, a 70 to 200 is what? Maybe two seconds exposure, that's maximum time. I know that with this tracker, I can get about 30 to 60 seconds of exposure time, okay? So instead of two seconds, we're talking almost 30 seconds to a minute of total exposure time without any sort of trailing because this is tracking with it. But you all, there's no surefire thing. I can't tell you that if you buy a sky tracker, it's gonna be 30 seconds or a minute. It depends on your specific sky tracker, how well it's machined. It could be 45 seconds, it could be 30, could be two minutes. There's a lot of variables in there. Does that make sense, you all? All right, you're buying accuracy. You're buying precision, you're buying gear ratios, like was said there. All right, questions with this so far? Okay, I wanna take it up one notch. Sky trackers are great, and I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, I, uh, I don't travel anywhere without my sky tracker. Like, I bring that thing with me wherever I go. Uh, but this guy, let me bring it in frame here for everyone on the stream, not bonk into anything. This is one step up, and this is called the sky guider. So instead of the sky tracker, it's the sky guider. Now, this little guy does not come with it. It's really just this red thing, but what immediately do you notice here? It's got a weight down at the bottom, a counterweight. Okay, so check this out. If I loosen this guy, this is called a clutch, this holds the thing still, and I position this guy right here, and I let go, it's loose right now and it stays put. I can position this wherever I want to position it, and it stays. And so what this allows you to do, because it has a counterweight shaft, is to use a much heavier camera and lens combination. I could use this on the sky tracker, but it's not nearly as much fun to use because it's like heavy, it's leaning over to one side. With this guy, I can very precisely point at anything I'm looking to shoot. And then once I've pointed at it, I can lock down my clutch knobs, flip the switch, and it does the exact same tracking job. Okay, so it's doing the same thing. It just gives me greater precision. This can go between four and five minutes with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, okay? And then I talked about my other telescope mount at home. It can go indefinitely. It's so precise that I can just shoot for hours if I wanted to. But there's obviously a limit. Why couldn't I take a four-hour exposure? One four-hour shot. Overexposed. Overexposed. Yeah, there's just too much light in the sky, right? There's going to be a point where you're at ISO 100, right? And your aperture is at like f5.6, and you're still bright white because you've been shooting for four hours. Like there's a limit to what you can do. But the nicer the mount, the more tracking sensitivity you get, okay? So these are super great. Neither of them though has that go-to functionality that I was talking about where you can program in, go to the Andromeda galaxy and it just goes and points there. That you need to spend like $1,000, $2,000 to get that ability. But honestly, these are kind of fun because they make you learn the sky. Like you have to know the sky a little bit. You have to know star patterns and constellations and that kind of is a fun challenge. It's, it's a hobby in itself. So that's what these are. Does any questions with that so far? Yes. What are the batteries for these? So they both actually have internal lithium batteries. So they, they will run for about 12 hours on those batteries, um, but they both have USB charge ports. So I actually have a little USB power bank that I strapped to my tripod, and I use this to power my camera and my tracker during long uh, shooting sessions because I don't like my camera running out either. So that's totally a doable thing. Anything that charges with USB, you can just get a little USB power bank for like 30 bucks and that, that'll give you a lot more power, all right? One other thing I wanna mention and then I'm gonna call it a night um, is this thing up here on the top of my camera and this is something that's definitely not the topic of tonight but it's part of the topic of tonight but it's a more advanced concept. This is called a guide scope and you guys, what this does is this, notice it has its own little telescope and this is actually a camera right here. This is a very sensitive specialty astronomy camera 
what this little guy does is it watches a nearby star. So if you think about it, if you've got the Andromeda galaxy and that's what the camera is pointed at, this little guy is pointed at some star near the Andromeda galaxy. Does that make sense to you guys? This little camera is way more sensitive to slight movement than my big DSLR is. So if my mount starts to kind of fail at all or not quite track perfectly, my guide scope is going to see it and my guide camera is going to see it before my DSLR picks up any sort of movement because this is more sensitive. Well, you'll notice this guide scope is plugged into the mount. So what happens is, and this is amazing technology, if you guys get more into it, this is what you'll get into. This little camera will actually send corrections to the mount to adjust for any tracking error. And it does all of that before the camera notices anything going on. So your camera shot, the shot that the DSLR takes, is perfect because this little guy is way more sensitive than what your camera is. So it's able to see those minute variations. And that's called a guide scope and a guide camera. And they're there just for the purposes of keeping things more aligned. All right. So I know that was a lot of information for you guys. I know that that was fun. I, I hope it was fun. Actually, I don't know that it was fun. Hopefully you had fun. Um, let me move this out of the way and let me just summarize real quick. So here's the thing, you guys. Uh, astrophotography, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people can have a lot of fun with. And I think a lot of people think it's harder than it actually is. It's really not that challenging. You go out there and, you know, I, we didn't go into specific software programs and how to use them, but there are so many YouTube tutorials out there on how to do all of that stuff. I kind of wanted to give you guys just a rough overview on what you can expect to be an astrophotographer and to start getting your feet wet. So my assignment to all of you, I can't give you assignments because it's a free lecture, but if you wanted to have an assignment is to the next clear night, especially here in the winter, just go outside with a long lens. And if you only have a, a 100 millimeter, maybe you only have the kit lens on your camera, like an 18 to 55, that's fine. Get Stellarium, that free program, that free planetarium program, look around and maybe find a chunk of sky with a few objects in it. In fact, Stellarium even has this cool ability and you'll have to Google it how to do this, where you can tell Stellarium what camera and what lens you're using and it will show you on the sky with that camera and lens, how much of the sky will be in the picture. And so you can kind of move it around and compose and find a chunk of sky with a lot of little objects in it with your 18 to 55 millimeter lens. The advantage of having only an 18 to 55 is what? The 400 rule, you can use a what, eight second shutter speed while the 70 to 200 people can only use a two second shutter speed. So count yourselves lucky in some respects, go out and shoot something, go out to Stellarium Planet, Put it together in Deep Sky Stacker and just see what you end up with. All right. Um, Andy, yes. Quick question from online. Yeah. What is the brand of guide scope and which one are you following? Ah, that's a great question. So these are made by, yeah, so you guys, um, the guide scope and the guide camera that I use particularly, I actually use a different one at my observatory at home. But this one, and this is the one I would recommend for most of you guys, is a, uh, made by a company called QHYCCD. QHY. CCD. CCD is a type of sensor. QHY is the brand. It's the QHY CCD and they make both the camera and the scope. And the cool thing is about that little setup is because they're both made by the same company, they screw together perfectly. They focus well. There's all these good things. When, if you start getting in more into astronomy and buying telescopes, you'll quickly learn that you need all these weird adapters to get things to focus correctly. There's all these different things. So because those are both made by the same company, it makes things super easy. All right. Any questions from you guys in here? All right. Well, good deal. Thank you guys so much for watching or watching, listening, whatever it happens to be. I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank definitely. You. Isn't Astro fun? It's so good. It's so good. <laughs>